everyone and welcome to today's Employment Law Update with Keely Bajant of KSAB Law. Today we're going to cover case law developments in the area of discrimination, harassment, bullying and holiday pay. Um, the session today will be recorded and sent to you in the next week. Um, please feel free to ask questions as you're going along in the chat box and we'll answer them as we can. Um, so I'll pass over to Keely and um, I hope you enjoy the session. Hello everyone, and as Eloise said, welcome to today's HR Huddle, um, the Employment Law Update. Um, so we last had the update back in July, would you believe? Um, there hasn't actually been a huge amount of case law going through the tribunals. However, what has gone through, um, some of the decisions are quite technical and dealing with quite meaty bits of law. So I'm going to try and relay all that to you today, focusing on some particular areas, those that I've highlighted by Eloise at the beginning, but also I'm going to discuss with you settlement agreements and some um, developments in that area, um, holiday pay, um, the big Supreme um, Court case, um, uh, dealing also with discrimination on the grounds of religion or religious belief, um, and then moving on to consider some legislative changes as well as what's on the horizon. So I'm going to share my slides with you today. Um, hopefully you will be able to see that. Um, so let me just do my slideshow as well. Right. So dealing then firstly with settlement agreements, uh, um, over the last year in particular, I've seen a real growth area in this in terms of how many employers are attempting to exit employees under settlement agreements, um, as I say, particularly in the last year. As you know, there's this provision in the Employment Rights Act that allows employers to enter into what's referred to as a protected conversation or sometimes referred to as pre-termination negotiations um, with an employee with a view to reach an agreed exit, agree, an agreed termination of their employment. Um, what that does, as I say, is enables the exit to be agreed under the terms of a settlement agreement and both parties walk away. Um, a protected conversation is usually entered into as an alternative to commencing or continuing with another process. So that might be a capability performance process, or it might be a disciplinary process, or even a redundancy procedure. And an employer will put it to the employee as another option for them to consider. When it's used correctly and appropriately, um, it's very useful um, because it's a confidential discussion, um, which means that if an employee, if the negotiations break down um, and the employee continues in employment, but they are thereafter dismissed, and then the employment tribunal won't be able to consider what happened and look at what happened during the procedure. Um, it will just look at the procedure itself. So it, won't, it, it will look at the disciplinary process or the capability procedure, but it won't look at what happened during the protected conversation. Um, that is then truly confidential. However, the use of protected conversations need to be exercised with caution and with legal advice, because if they are conducted inappropriately, um, then the protected conversation will not be confidential. And what that means is that if then the employee does bring a claim, they can rely on that discussion or that protected conversation to support their claim if they need to do so. So a protected conversation will not be confidential um, in certain circumstances. The first one is where an employee is dismissed for an automatically unfair reason. Um, they're the reasons that are listed in the legislation. They include whistleblowing, trade union membership, um, and, an asserting, and, a, and asserting a statutory right. So in those situations, an employer can't rely on a protected conversation to be confidential, and it will be and can be disclosed to the employment tribunal. Also, if an employee brings a claim of discrimination or victimization or harassment, 
um, then again, the protective conversation may not be confidential and again may be relied upon by the employee in support of their claim. Also, if there is any improper behaviour by the employer, um, it is up to the Employment Tribunal to determine what improper behaviour is, but there is a list. Um, and the list includes, again, all forms of discrimination, harassment, victimisation. It also includes um, a situation where the employee hasn't been given a reasonable amount of time to consider the settlement agreement. And a reasonable amount of time is suggested in the code to be 10 calendar days. So if an employer were to issue a settlement agreement to an employee and say, right, you need to take legal advice and you need to enter into, into this agreement um, within two days, then that would be considered to be unreasonable behaviour and could result in the employee being able to bring the protected conversation um, and those discussions to the attention of the employment tribunal in support of their claim. Also unreasonable conduct includes any form of disciplinary process that has begun and if the um, settlement proposal is rejected and the employer says, well, um, if you reject this proposal, then you're going to be dismissed, um, that would be regarded quite obviously as improper behaviour because it implies that, well, it, it, it's putting undue um, uh, duress on the employee um, to force them into signing the settlement agreement and, and threatening them with dismissal if they don't. Um, and then finally, unreasonable behaviour would include an employee threatening to undermine an organisation's public reputation if the organisation doesn't enter into the settlement agreement. So it works both ways here. It's unreasonable behaviour on, on the part of the employer, as well as unreasonable behaviour on part of the employee. Um, if a protected conversation is successful, then as I said, um, what happens is the employer will then issue a settlement agreement detailing the terms um, of the agreement um, to exit the employee. Um, the effect of that settlement agreement is such that it prevents the employee from then bringing any claim that they may have in relation to the termination of their employment or the employment itself. So it compromises or settles those claims. In consideration of that promise not to bring a claim, the employer will usually um, offer the employee and pay them what's called a termination payment, um, or it's an ex gratia sum, um, or it's a compensation sum, usually referred to as a termination payment. And if that termination payment is below £30,000, then it can usually be paid to the employee free of tax. Um, the content of settlement agreements um, has changed over the years. And in particular, um, in 2018, um, there was a, quite a significant change. Um, but it does seem to have, it's, that change does seem to have been unnoticed by some employers. So what that change did was that, um, so prior to the 2018 position, payment in lieu of notice, um, payments in lieu of notice, so where an employer doesn't require the employee to work out the notice period, but pays them in lieu of it, and um, those payments may have been paid to the employee tax-free or lumped into the termination payment and treated as tax-free. Um, and whether or not the payment in lieu of notice was taxable was really dependent on the terms of the contract of employment and whether or not there was a clause in the contract which allowed the employer to pay the employee in lieu of notice and not require them to work out the notice period, or if the employer had a custom and practice of not paying, um, sorry, of paying employees in lieu of notice. Now, if that those elements were present, then the notice payment should be taxed. But if they weren't, then it could be paid tax free to the employee's compensation. That position changed in April 2018, when the concept 
of post-employment notice pay was introduced in the tax legislation. Um, and what that did was it ensured that any payment in lieu of notice, whether or not it was pursuant to the contract of employment or not, should be taxed. Um, and the payment um, uh, <laughs> in lieu of notice, oh, what was that? <laughs> and the payment in lieu of notice, as I say, would have to be taxed. So, so that changed the position. And, and what I've been seeing, um, and I think some of my colleagues have been seeing in, in over the last year, is, is a use of um, probably outdated settlement agreements or um, a termination payment that may include a payment in lieu of notice that then isn't being taxed appropriately um, and isn't being paid um, in accordance with the um, uh, post-employment notice pay provisions in the, new, in the legislation. So broadly speaking, the post-employment notice pay is the basic salary that the employee would have been paid had they worked out their notice. And what the provision says is that that payment must be taxed. Um, in addition, then, um, since April 2020, real-time employer class 1A national insurance contributions charges have applied um, when tax applies over the first £30,000, but not employee national insurance contributions. So that's a further change that some employers may have missed. Um, also, non-cash benefits that form part of a termination arrangement or a termination package must be valued in order to determine whether or not they fall within the first, the first £30,000 tax exemption or whether they are valued above that and therefore they should be taxed. Um, so, as I say, it, it's worth employees, if they are going to be using settlement agreements, just to refresh their minds on what the appropriate tax legislation is, um, where, the, um, where they're paying in lieu of notice, that sum must be taxed, and valuing any benefits that they're providing to the employee as part of the termination package. There's also been a recent case on settlement agreements that it's worth me mentioning, and that's the case of Mr. Charles Melvin Bathgate and Technip, Technip UK Limited. Um, in that case, the Employment Tribunal had to consider the enforceability of one of the clauses that was in the settlement agreement. Um, usually in settlement agreements, there is a clause which says that the employee agrees not to make any claims against the employer, including any claims which they are not aware of at the time that they sign the agreement. Now, I've always said this seems to be very unfair because how can an employee settle a claim and agree not to bring a claim that they don't even know about and that may occur in the future? Um, and what the tribunal said in this case was exactly that, that this isn't fair and those clauses are not enforceable. So in the case, um, the claimant, Mr. Bathgate, had been employed for the ship operator Technip for almost 20 years and um, before he was made redundant from his chief officer position in January 2017. He was 61 at the time of his redundancy. In December 2016, the company decided there was a need for redundancies at his grade. He was sent a settlement agreement that laid out the redundancy terms and he accepted those. This included an enhanced redundancy and notice payment payable with his final salary and an additional sum which would be paid to him in June 2017. It also included a clause which confirmed that any future claim of age discrimination that the employee may have in the future is being compromised by the employee entering into the settlement agreement. In March 2017, the company decided that the additional sum would not be paid to those aged 61 years and over, and this was not communicated to Mr. Bathgate until June 2017, i.e. when he was about to leave. Bathgate claimed this amounted to age discrimination, and obviously at this time he'd already signed the settlement agreement. So he said, well, this is age discrimination, 
And although the company accepted that age was the reason he was not paid the sum, it said that by him signing the agreement, he was unable to bring a claim of age discrimination um, because he'd compromised that, that claim. Of course, the EAT um, decided that that was unfair. Um, Lord Summers stated, in this case, the claimant signed away his right to sue for age discrimination before he knew whether he had a claim or not. While that may be possible at common law, under the Equality Act, that is not possible. Um, so on this basis, what we do, we need, we need to definitely be aware that if we are asking employees to sign settlement agreements, um, even though those clauses might be in the agreement which state that an employee is settling any future claim that they may have, that particular um, clause is not going to be enforceable. They'll still be there, but um, and it might be a deterrent for an employee, um, but enforceability wise, it's, it, it can't be relied upon. Um, what we should be doing in these kind of situations is entering into settlement agreements with employees um, at one point in time. If they're then going to continue in employment, then what you usually do is um, ask them to sign a reaffirmation letter at the time that they exit. Um, and you make any ex gratia payment um, that's going to be made to them conditional upon them signing the reaffirmation letter. Um, so in effect, you'll have two documents instead of one. Um, but that's the only way to settle any um, claim that arises from the date that the initial settlement agreement is entered into um, uh, and then um, settle any claim that the employee may have on, on termination, which occurs at a later date. Um, staying then with the theme of settlement agreements, the next case is that of Mrs A against HMRC. Um, it, this case really demonstrates how important it is to get the, uh, the taxability of the payment right um, and look into exactly what the termination payment comprises of. The facts of the case are that Mrs A entered into a settlement agreement with her employer um, under which she agreed to be bound by confidentiality and non-disclosure ob obligations. Again, they're common in settlement agreements, employees agreeing not to um, disclose the terms of the settlement agreement with any third party, and also perhaps agreeing um, not to compete or poach um, post um, termination of their employment. Um, in this case, um, the clause related to um, making sure that the circumstances surrounding the um, settlement agreement and the fact of the settlement agreement was kept confidential. Um, under the settlement agreement, um, Mrs A received compensation <clears throat> on the condition that she, <clears throat> that she would be bound by confidentiality and non-disclosure obligations. The employer treated the compensation as being connected with the termination of her, her employment and so um, as compensation for loss of office and so it treated the first £30,000 of that sum tax-free. However, the tribunal concluded that the element of the termination payment that related to the consideration for the employee, Mrs A, to enter into those confidentiality obligations should have been taxed. Um, so in effect, what the employee should have done is separated out any monies that it was paying to the employee to keep the terms of the agreement confidential and tax that payment in the appropriate way. Um, as I said, that, that case really does demonstrate that we need to look into the termination payment and, and break it down and break down what we're offering the employee to, de to determine whether or not those elements are taxable. Um, the, the, um, the payments and arrangements detailed on the slide are worth considering because if we can split up the payments, in this way, then, as I say, we can determine whether or not they should be taxed. So firstly, looking then at the payment, um, determining whether or not that should um, amount or, or that includes an element relating to earnings from employment. So it could be benefits or it could be monetary earnings. And if 
any sum is being paid to the employee's earnings, then that should be taxed in the normal way. If any part of the payment is being made in, restrict, in respect of a restrictive covenant or a confidentiality obligation, then again, tax and national insurance should be deducted in the same way. Question also, does the payment relate to a pension or is it linked in any way to retirement because special rules apply to those payments? Um, and then lastly, consider whether the payment, if it doesn't fall into any of the other categories, is a payment in compensation for the termination of the employee's employment. And if it is, then it may fall into the tax exemption category of under, and if it's under £30,000, can be paid to the employee tax-free. So um, just finishing off with the termination payments and some frequently asked um, questions. Do you need to report termination payments to HMRC? Um, where the value of the settlement is more than £30,000, then a formal report needs to be made to HMRC by the 6th of July following the tax year in which the payment is made. Um, it can be usually done through payroll. It doesn't have to be on any particular form. Um, it's just a, a formal notification to HMRC by that date. Um, Another question, can you obtain HMRC clearance? Yes, you can. It takes a long time, but if the employee or the employer is particularly concerned about whether or not the termination payment or some of it should be taxed, then it can get clearance from HMRC um, by asking the question. But as I say, it, it can take a long time for the answer to come. And what records should employers keep? Um, well, as you know, HMRC could look into any termination payments or any settlement agreement packages. So, of course, keep the relevant documentation together um, somewhere safe um, on your computer systems or in a, in a paper file um, and ensure that they can be inspected if necessary. Um, and I think it's six years to keep those documentation, that documentation and information. Moving on then to the next topic, um, and in particular, it relates to the calculation of holiday pay for term time workers or, or people working irregular hours or only part of the year. Um, and this is really one of the most significant decisions in 2022. Um, I'm sure you saw, you have seen quite a lot of publicity around this case. Um, and the case is called Harper Trust and Brazil, and it was decided in July last year. Um, the background to the case then is the working time regulations. So um, as we know, workers in Great Britain, including part-time workers, have the right to 5.6 weeks of annual leave. That's under the working time regulations. And workers are entitled to be paid at the rate of a week's pay in respect of each week of leave that they take. Now, how this applies to a worker with no normal hours of work can be really difficult to establish. And some of some employers in the past have taken the approach of saying that holiday entitlement accrues at the rate of 12.07% of hours worked. Now that has been worked out on the basis that the standard working year is 46.6 weeks. That's 52 weeks minus the 5.6 weeks holiday entitlement. Um, and then 12.07% um, is of 46.4 weeks. Um, so that used to be the approach that was recommended by ACAS. So in effect, what employers did was state in the contract, um, you will work these hours, your holiday entitlement will be worked out um, on the basis of the hours that you work, and it will be worked out on the basis of 12.07% of the hours that you work. So that was, as I say, quite a common practice for employees who work irregular hours. That has now been removed from the ACAS booklet. Um, and um, 
and that has resulted from this case. Looking then at pay for um, the worker when they go on holiday, as I said, a worker's holiday pay entitlement is a week's pay for each week of leave. So if a worker does not have normal hours, a week's pay is taken to be the worker's average weekly pay in a reference period of 52 weeks before they go on holiday. So that's at, at the calculation date. Um, any weeks in which no remuneration has been received are excluded from that reference period and earlier weeks are taken into account instead. So the calculation period could actually be longer than 52 weeks because, as I've said, any weeks not worked will be disregarded. Now, that used to be 12 weeks. But from the 6th of April 2020, that changed to a reference period of 52 weeks. Um, and then lastly, just looking at the principle of part time um, working and the um, fact that the expectation under legislation and the requirement under legislation is that we should not discriminate against part time workers. And that means in practice, um, pro ratering their entitlement against comparable full time employee. So what are the facts of this case then? Mrs. Brazil was a visiting music teacher at a school run by Harper Trust, we'll call it Harper. She was employed by Harper under a permanent contract on a zero hours basis. Harper is not obliged to provide a fixed minimum amount of work and she was paid only for the amount of work that she carried out. Mrs. Brazil worked mainly during school term time the length of the school term varies from year to year, but is between 32 and 35 weeks. She's a part-time worker in two senses. The first is that she did not work a full working week. And then secondly, she's a part-time worker because she only works part of the year. So she only works some of the week and she only works some of the year. Now, it's the sum of the year aspect of the working arrangement that this case focuses on. Brazil was entitled to 5.6 weeks and paid annual leave, both under contract and under statute, which she was required to take during school holidays. So the norm. As the school holidays are far longer than this, no particular weeks were designated as statutory holiday, but by agreement, Harper made three equal payments in respect of holiday at the end of each of the three terms of the year. And following the ACAS guidance, Harper calculated Mrs. Brazil's earnings at the end of each term and paid her 12.07% of that figure. So it's a, that was quite, that's quite a common situation, as you can imagine, in schools, in the education system. So Mrs. Brazil brought a claim in the Employment Tribunal for unlawful deductions in wages in respect of holiday pay. She asserted that the 12.07% approach bears no relation to the calculation required by the working time regulations. She argued that her holiday entitlement should be paid at the level of her average earnings over a 12 week reference period immediately, immediately before she took the holiday. Um, obviously that's now increased to 52 weeks. However, that approach would have resulted in her as a term time only employee receiving a higher percentage of annual earnings as holiday pay. So if she worked 32 weeks of the year, it would equate to 17.5% of her annual earnings. Brazil submitted that there was nothing in the relevant provisions in the working time regulations requiring a different approach where the worker does not work a full year. And no, the working time regulation doesn't deal with um, part year workers. So what did the tribunal say? The tribunal disagreed with her and they agreed with the school. Um, they dismissed her claim and they said, look, we want to apply that we think the pro rata principle should apply and that the statutory scheme should actually be read time for part time or part year workers who worked fewer than 46.4 weeks per year 
so that the payment was actually then capped at 12.07% of the annualised hours. Mrs Brazil appealed to the EAT and the EAT agreed with her and disagreed with the tribunal. Um, and they said um, that there was no requirement in the working time regulations to pro rata the holiday pay for part year workers and that it therefore should not have been capped at the 12.07%. The employer Harper then appealed to the Court of Appeal um, and the Court of Appeal reached a similar um, decision to the EAT, um, agreeing with the EAT, holding that attempting to build a pro rating requirement in the working time regulations would make it an entirely different scheme to what is detailed. Um, the court stated that the calculation exercise required by the working time regulations is straightforward and should be followed, even if it results in part year workers receiving a higher proportion of their annual earnings as holiday. So what did Harper do? Appeal to the Supreme Court. And the decision of the Supreme Court was that it agreed with the Court of Appeal and it agreed with the EAT. Um, and for substantially the same reasons. It's, it's really tricky one because obviously on a strict reading of the working time regulations, then, and that's what the higher courts did in this case, um, then it is going to um, ensure that or result in um, these part year workers receiving a higher proportion of holiday, holiday pay, um, and not and actually therefore benefiting much more um, than probably what was initially intended um, by the legislation, but that is the position. Um, so there is a logic, isn't there, that holidays should actually flow from the amount of work conducted by an employee, but obviously the decision in this case goes against that. Um, who does the case apply to? Um, there has been quite a lot of speculation. In a sense, the ruling applies to all workers, but in practical terms, it applies to workers without normal working hours and those who are working um, part year um, uh, or term time workers in particular. The question now arises is um, how do employers deal with it? How do they calculate holiday and holiday pay for those conducting irregular work, example, part year workers, casual workers, and others working at irregular hours? Um, and the only reliable answer at the moment is to use the what we call the calendar week method. Um, if the worker takes a week's holiday, they should be paid a week's pay calculated according to the statutory formula, i.e. looking back at the reference period of 52 weeks. Um, this may produce a different rate of pay each time the holiday is taken. Um, what is the possible outcome of this case for employers? Some employers may react to this case by changing the way in which they use zero hour contracts, um, for example, by ensuring that zero hour workers are given at least some week, e uh, some work each week um, when they're not taking annual leave. Um, in other cases involving term time workers like Mrs. Brazil, it may be possible to engage the worker at the start of the um, term and then um, uh, engage them on a fixed term contract where the contract then finishes at the end of the term. But that could bring um, a whole host of problems if you're using consistent fixed term contracts. Um, are there any further consequences of this case? Yes, there may be a flurry of claims in the employment tribunal by workers, term time workers, term time employees um, for unlawful deduction in wages if um, employers have been calculating their holiday based on 12.07% of the hours that they have worked. Um, the judgment in the case has also resulted in two key issues. Firstly, while it's been suggested that the new law um, will not amount to a significant change for a significant number of workers, um, it will and, and, and will cause some problems for um, obviously some employers. 
um, and causes and results in um, hugely anom anomalous results. Um, for example, a sports coach or an invigilator engaged by a school on a permanent contract, but only required to work for one or two um, weeks each year, could receive holiday pay vastly greater than their wages and equal to their full-time colleagues. Um, because obviously we're looking at the, the reference period of 52 weeks before. Secondly, although the holiday, calculate, holiday calculation set out in the Supreme Court was simple enough, average weekly pay from the previous 52 weeks, excluding weeks not worked, multiplied by 5.6 weeks, the practical implication of this has been causing, as you can imagine, some headaches for employers. Um, the calculation also results in unfairness. Um, for those with different working patterns, a part-year a part -year employee working 30 hours every other week would earn twice as much holiday pay as a similar employee working 15 hours every week, despite the fact they work the same total number of hours in the year. So what has this resulted in? Well, it's resulted in the government um, starting some urgent consultation um, about the interpretation of the working time regulations. Um, the purpose of the consultation is to make sure that workers receive holiday pay um, that reflects the hours that they have actually worked, which the government is saying is really what was intended by the working time regulations. Um, in, address, in addition to addressing that disparity, it's also hoped that the new legislation will um, provide some clarity about the calculation method. So as part of the consultation, the government has already set out its proposed method of amending the law. Um, it's been suggested that weeks not worked are included when calculating the 52-week 52 re 52 um, reference period rather than excluding them as part of the Herpa decision. Um, so the total hours worked will then be multiplied by 12.07% to calculate the total holiday entitlement. So that is what is being suggested under the consultation. So the next steps will be for the responses to the consultation um, to be published. Um, consultation ends tomorrow. Um, and then um, for the government to then swiftly make some legislation or draft some legislation um, that changes the decision made in Harper. Um, and I mean, it says here that there's 700,000 workers that are now benefiting from an increased holiday entitlement following the judgment. So um, although some solace is that the government is pushing this consultation through, usual consultation periods take 12 weeks, this is being pushed through in eight. So it seems like they are taking it very seriously. So we'll watch this space. Moving on then to the next area, um, and in particular, um, the area of discrimination on the ground of religion or religious belief. We've had a few decisions in this area that I've um, referred to in previous updates, but there's now another case that's come through. Um, as we know, religion or belief is a protected characteristic under Section 4 of the Equality Act. Um, the category covers not only religious beliefs, but also what is referred to as a similar philosophical belief. And over the years, we have seen employees and workers attempting to bring cases of discrimination related to this protected characteristic um, and successfully arguing in some that, um, for example, a belief in climate change is caught, as well as um, ethical veganism, which is a case that I referred to, it's probably a couple of years ago now. In the most recent case in this area, an employee has attempted to argue that supporting a football club amounts to a protected belief. <laughs> so this is the case of McClung and Doosan Babcock Limited and others. So the question is, and the question for the Employment Tribunal to consider at a preliminary hearing was whether or not supporting Rangers for the claimant uh, Mr. McClung amounted to a protected um, philosophical or religious belief. What do we think? <laughs> 
Yes, well, common sense did prevail in this case. And um, the Employment Tribunal held that um, the supporting a football club was not a protected belief, thank goodness. Um, so the facts of the case are that Mr McClung had supported Rangers for 42 years, um, was a member of the club and received yearly birthday cards from them. He never missed a match and spent most of his discretionary income on attendance at games, as well as watching them on television. He believed supporting Rangers was a way of life and import and as important to him as attending church is for religious people. The tribunal defined Mr McClung's belief as being a supporter of Rangers, but concluded that it was not capable of being a protected philosophical belief. While it was not in dispute that the belief was genuinely held, the tribunal concluded that the remaining necessary criteria under the previous case of Granger, the climate change case, um, were not satisfied for the following reasons. Firstly, then, the tribunal had regard to the explanatory notes of the Equality Act, which provide that adherence to a football team um, would not be a belief capable of protection. Also, support for a football club is akin to a lifestyle choice. It did not represent a belief as to a weighty or substantial aspect of human life and had no larger consequences for humanity as a whole. There were a wide range of Rangers fans with varying reasons behind their support shown in different ways. So there was not that um, element of um, cohesiveness. There was nothing to suggest fans had to behave or did behave in a similar way. Support for the union and loyalty to the Queen were not prerequisites of being a Rangers supporter as Mr McClung had submitted. The only common factor was that fans wanted their team to do well. It therefore lacked the required characteristics of cogency, cohesiveness and importance. And finally, support for Rangers did not invoke the same respect in a democratic society as matters such as ethical veganism or the governance of a country, which have been the subject of academic research and commentary. Um, another case in this area um, of religion or religious belief is the case of Four Stata and CGD Europe and others. Um, in that case, the claimant claimed direct discrimination when the respondent declined to renew her contract um, because of her expression of gender critical beliefs on Twitter and at work. And you may have seen some um, reports about this case. It did receive quite a lot of press attention at the time. The background to the case is that, um, as we've seen, um, religion or religious belief is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act, um, and it is direct discrimination to treat a person less favorably because of their religion or religious belief. Um, the tribunals are under an obligation to interpret domestic legislation like the Equality Act in a manner that's consistent with the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and the particular articles of the um, Convention are Article 9, which protects the freedom of thought, conscience and religion, including the freedom to manifest one's belief in practice, and also Article 10, um, of the European Convention of Human Rights, which protects freedom of expression, which includes the freedom to hold opinions and to receive and impart information and ideas. Freedom to manifest beliefs and freedom of expression are qualified rights, which may only be restricted in certain circumstances, um, where there is, for example, where it's necessary in a, in a democratic society, in the interest of public safety, um, or for the protection of public order, health or morals, um, or for the protection of rights of others. So they are fundamental rights that have to be protected, other than in those very restricted situations. Um, in some cases, relating to um, the crossover of beliefs. So 
in this situation, the religion or religious belief. Um, a respondent to a claim may argue that the reason for the less favourable treatment is not actually the belief itself, because if it was the belief itself, of course, it would amount to direct discrimination. You know, the less favourable treatment, whether that's dismissal or something else, um, is because of the employee or individual holding that um, protected belief. And what employees have said that it's not because of the belief, it's actually the way in which that belief has been manifested. So the way in which the employer individual has demonstrated and shown that belief, which is the reason for the less favorable treatment. Now in those kinds of situations, it may not then be direct discrimination based on religion belief because religion or belief because the employer is actually not treated the employee um, less favorably because of the belief. But if the manifestation or the way that the employee has um, shown their belief or demonstrated their belief is inappropriate, um, then actually the employment tribunal will say, no, it's because of the belief, because the way that you manifested it was inappropriate in the circumstances. So that's the way the tribunals have got around it. It's quite a fiddly argument. Um, but ultimately, what employees are saying, we didn't treat this person um, less favorably or we didn't dismiss them because of their belief. We dismissed them because of the way in which they manifested that belief. And therefore, we haven't directly discriminated against them. And the tribunal says, well, let's have a look at the way that they manifested the belief. And if that is inappropriate, um, uh, then then they won't succeed in in their in their discrimination claim. Um, so the facts of this case are that um, CGD is a not-for-profit think tank based in America that focuses on international development. The claimant, Mrs. Forstater, was a visiting fellow and had entered into consultancy agreements with its UK-based European arm CGD Europe, the last of which ended on 31st December 2018. Uh, Mrs. F believes that a person's sex is a material reality um, that should not be um, confused with or treated the same as gender or gender identity. She believes that a person's sex is a unchangeable, immutable, biological fact, um, not a feeling or an identity, and that a trans woman is not in reality a woman. She believes that while a person can identify as another sex and ask other people to go along with that um, and can change their legal sex under the Gender Recognition Act, this does not change their actual sex. Mrs. F engaged in debates on social media about gender identity issues um, and made a number of statements in opposition to the government's proposed amendments to the Gender Recognition Act. In doing so, she made some remarks which some trans people found offensive. She also brought into the office and posted on Twitter materials by campaigning organisation Fair Play for Women, which described allowing gender self-identification as stupid, dangerous and unfair to women. Some of her colleagues complained that they found her conduct offensive and following an investigation, her fellowship was not renewed. So that's the less favorable treatment, the non-renewal of the fellowship. Um, so Mrs. F presented claims in the employment tribunal um, against um, CGDA, CGD and its president, Mr. Ahmed. She claimed that the non-renewal of her contract um, and some other detriments amounted to, amounted to discrimination on grounds of her gender critical belief, which she said was a protected belief um, under the Equality Act. She also alleged a number of instances of victimization. At a preliminary hearing, an employment tribunal concluded that Mrs. F's beliefs did not qualify as a protected belief. Um, and therefore um, her beliefs were not a protected characteristic. However, this was then overruled by the EAT. Um, the EAT said, yes, they are a protected belief. And the case was then remitted back to an employment tribunal to consider whether or not she had been um, discriminated against 
because of those or because of that protected um, belief. Um, well, what did the Employment Tribunal do? The Employment Tribunal upheld her direct discrimination claim firstly. And with regard to this, the tribunal found that Mrs. F had suffered less favourable treatment in that CGT had decided not to renew her visiting fellow um, or offer her a contract as a senior fellow. Um, the employment tribunal then had to consider what was the reason for that less favourable treatment. Um, and that was the main issue that the tribunal considered in the case. So the question therefore arose as to whether or not she was treated less favourably because of her belief or less favourably because of the manifestation of her belief. And it was the manifestation of her belief. That's the way she was communicated. That, that resulted in the communications. So the question therefore was whether Mrs. Um, F's had manifested her beliefs in a manner to which objection could reasonably um, be taken or to put it another way, had she manifested them in an inappropriate way? Um, and if she had communicated them in an inappropriate way, then her claim would fail. Um, so the tribunal went on to find that none of the manifestations of Mrs. F's belief taken individually or looked at as a whole were objectively offensive or unreasonable. Um, and it also, and, and therefore um, her claim for direct discrimination um, succeeded. It's useful just to look at a couple of the individual manifestations that were relied upon um, by the respondents in defending the case that they were saying were offensive and unreasonable. Um, one of these was when uh, Mrs. F had stated that people should, of course, be able to define their identity any way they like, but other people are not compelled to accept it as relating to any material reality, and that a man's internal feeling that he is a woman has no basis in material reality. In considering this example, the tribunal considered these to be straightforward statements of Mrs. F, of Mrs. F's protected gender critical belief and so not something which objection could reasonably be taken or could be inappropriate. Um, also Mrs F had Mrs F had stated that under self ID a trans woman is any male who identifies as a woman a feeling in their head. I am a woman but I don't have a feeling in my head. The tribunal rejected the respondent's argument that that reference to feeling in their head inappropriately equated self-ID with mental illness and held that it was little more than asserting Mrs. F's gender critical belief. So, I mean, the, the tribunal was actually, I think, quite open in terms of accepting what um, Mrs. F had said um, as being appropriate manifestations of her protected belief um, and therefore um, they decided that she had been discriminated, discriminated against directly because of her protected belief. In respect of the victimisation claim, um, she made an allegation or, or she was making her allegations and, and talking about her case to the press um, and because of that she was removed from the respondent's website um, so as a result of the protected act of um, asserting that she had been discriminated against, she was removed off their website and therefore her victimisation claim in that regard succeeded as well. Um, so just a quick comment on this, really. Um, it does. It's only first instance decision, so it's not being appealed. We wait to see if the respondents appeal the decision. I'm sure they will. Um, but it's it's a really well um, written judgment and um, it's it's made clear that the manifestations of beliefs will be protected and will be um, uh, tolerated, provided they don't cross the line um, and they don't, um, uh, you know, they're not then reasonably perceived as inappropriate um, and going too far. But there's quite a lot of leeway in terms of that um, as per this decision.
Just moving on then to um, the next area, um, and that is disability discrimination and neurodiversity. So this is quite a big area, growth area again, in the area of employment law. There's been a sharp increase in claims being made by individuals, applicants to um, jobs, also employees in employment um, for disability um, relating to a, um, a neurodiverse condition such as autism or ADHD, or dyslexia. You can see on the slides the percentage rises in those claims. And this is just for 2021. So I'm sure if we looked at last year, um, the increase would be even more. Why is that? Um, that maybe people are talking more about their mental health now um, uh, and, and people are being more open minded about um, neurodiversity and um, it, it, people are being less fearful of making those disclosures to employers. Um, maybe it's because pe more people are being diagnosed with these conditions. Um, I'm sure there's a number of reasons, but for employers, it's important to recognise the increase, um, take on board the increase, because um, it's highly probable that a certain percentage of your workforce will be um, will have one of these neurodiverse um, conditions. Um, recommendation, of course, is to have a working equal opportunities policy. Um, recent cases in these areas are suggesting that not only employers should have equal opportunities policies, but they should be training staff regularly on equal opportunities, issues of discrimination, and including in those um, quite significant um, uh, details about disability discrimination, in particular to mental health issues and these neurodiverse conditions. Um, I am going to skip to these cases. I appreciate that um, it's nearly three o'clock, but I'm just going to run through these two, if that's okay with you, Eloise. Um, so Mr. Holland uh, suffered with um, Asperger's syndrome. Um, this is on the autism spectrum disorder. Um, and it constitutes a disability under the Equality Act. The definition of harassment, as we know, is unwanted conduct related to a protected characteristic, which has the purpose or effect, um, so it doesn't have to be purposeful, um, or effect of violating a person's dignity or creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment to that person. The facts of the case are that Mr. Holland, who worked for um, the coach company since 2016, was referred to by colleagues as special needs, imbecile and waste of space. Now, this might seem really harsh and something that you would not tolerate in your organisations at all, which is quite right. Um, but these things were said over a long period of time. So, um, and, and by, and by, staff at different levels so that needs to be taken into account too it was all said at the same time um, also in response to a message announcing a group training session on helping passengers with disabilities one colleague said we experience it every day working with him referring to the claimant um, holland said he would cry when alone dreaded going to work each day he didn't complain about the messages, but carried on as usual. In November 2020, he found out that his car had been damaged in the car park. Um, he was pressurised by his manager not to make an insurance claim about it. Um, and the manager said, if you do, you're going to be dismissed. Um, that resulted in Holland um, uh, not reporting it to his insurer. Um, and, and being fearful in the workplace about his um, uh, how he was being treated with them by his manager. Um, he, oh yes, that's right. In the end, he did actually go ahead and try and report the insurance claim. Um, and the transport manager said, you need to withdraw it, gave him a pen and paper in order for Holland to do that. 
um, and um, to make the claim um, and invalidate the claim. Um, Holland later reported that incident to the police and then resigned from the company. Holland requested um, payment of outstanding wages, but the transport manager told him um, he'd made deductions because he said that Holland had um, damaged some of the buses that he'd driven. Um, the Holland then um, sought employment from other bus companies, but they received emails from his previous employer um, asserting that he had um, damaged buses. Um, and also something about um, posing a danger to women. So, um, all, and the company also contacted the DVLA about um, concerns they had um, about Holland's mental state. Holland brings a claim for um, discrimination, harassment in the employment tribunal. Um, he, of course, wins his case. Um, the tribunal found that the company could not provide a non-discriminatory explanation for its treatment of the claimant. Um, the letter to the DVLA and the claimant's new employers were also seen as acts of harassment related to disability. The company was ordered to pay £576 in unpaid wages, as well as £25,000 in compensation and £4,069.23 in interest. It may seem a relatively low amount, but this was a low earner who, who we're talking about. Um, I would have thought it would be more. but um, So it, it's really, it may seem extreme and it may seem something that you wouldn't be tolerating in your organizations but I think it's really important to ensure that you are um, training staff on um, harassment discrimination and also in relation to neurodiverse conditions and then I'm just going to finish off then with Jandu and Marks and Spencer this, again, the case involved a neurodivergent um, uh, employee um, with the condition of dyslexia. Um, for the purposes of this case, it was determined that the dyslexia um, was a disability and, qual and qualified um, as a disability under the Equality Act. Um, the case involved a particular claim the employer had failed to make reasonable adjustments. Um, as we know, under the Equality Act, where a provision criterion or practice, a PCP, places a disabled employee at a substantial disadvantage, the employer is required to make reasonable adjustments to the PCP to avoid that disadvantage for the employee. Um, this case actually settled back end of last year, but it does underline the importance um, for employers to ensure that their redundancy processes and any other processes do not discriminate against disabled employees who are suffering with something like dyslexia or any other neurod neurodiverse condition. Um, so the facts of this case are that Miss Jandu was diagnosed with dyslexia while a mature university student in 2009. She was studying interior design, but struggling with some aspects of the work. As a result, she received an assessment from a clinical psychologist who compiled a study aid and strategies report. Given dyslexia's medically proven lifelong nature, the report was used by the court as an indicator of Jandu's current learning difficulties, which included weaknesses in working memory, weaknesses in processing visual information at speed, issues with tracking lines of text when reading, and some issues with spelling and more. Jandu was employed by Marks and Spencers at as a layout planner between 2013 and 2020. Given the issues Jandu faced with her work, she was clear with managers from the start of her employment about the support she would need. Most managers were more than happy um, to support her by reading through important emails that would be sent to wider teams from her, um, colour coding emails sent to help her identify key points or passages um, and similar things. Prior to Jandu's consultation for redundancy, she had not asked for any further support to manage her disability um, since she felt she was managing um, it with, uh, with her colleagues' um, support. 
Um, no formal issues with her work style and quality were um, raised by management. In July 2020, Jandu was placed into a redundancy consultation in which she was given a low score um, in a matrix for leadership and communication. So there the criteria which she scored low against leadership and communication. In meetings following this scoring, explanations provided to her um, in support of the score included that Jandu's emails appeared rushed and not thought through. In addition, it was discussed that Jandu was extremely was an extremely compliant employee, normally taking notes in meetings to action on her own time, but she didn't engage extensively in discussions. And this, along with other traits, were found to be linked to Jandu's dyslexia. Um, she raised dyslexia as a potential contributing factor as to why she had scored low on those particular two categories. Um, uh, she was rebuffed by managers um, and told that at the meetings that this was nothing to do with her dyslexia. Um, on appeal of her eventual dismissal for redundancy, Marks and Spencer's managerial team confirmed that Jandu's dyslexia had, in their view, nothing to do with the eventual outcome of the redundancy consultation, which was dismissal. Jandu therefore brought a claim for unfair dismissal and disability discrimination. And what do you think they found? Um, or what, what do you think happened? Did she succeed? Did she not succeed? Um, yeah, she did. She succeeded. Um, the Employment Tribunal fundamentally disagreed with Marks and Spencer's handling of Jandu's redundancy consultation and awarded her £50,000 following her successful unfair dismissal and discrimination claims. Um, it said that um, the dyslexia was clearly a disability in their view, um, having more than a minor effect on her ability to conduct day-to-day -day activities. The managers knew about the dyslexia, but no... Um, reasonable adjustments were made to the criteria um, or her scoring against the criteria to take account of the effects of her disability um, and uh, that therefore amounted to failure to make reasonable adjustments and um, disability discrimination in the circumstances. I think this is a really interesting case. It's one, it, and these issues apply to redundancy, um, selection criteria, but also to things like um, a capability procedure. So if you are performance managing an employee who has got something like dyslexia, um, then reasonable adjustments have to be made to the objectives that they are being required to, be, to, met, to meet during the capability performance process. And in this case, against the criteria or the application of the criteria to them in a scoring exercise. Um, and if those reasonable adjustments aren't made um, and, and scores aren't um, reflective of the um, condition, then an employer will be found to have um, discriminated against an employee because of their disability. So um, I'm going to miss out the unfair dismissal one and um, the, um, the last couple of slides are for you to read through. Um, Eloise will send them out to you all. They detail the increases that will take effect um, in respect of national minimum wage, um, also statutory maternity adoption and paternity, um, shared parental leave pay, um, also the weekly cap for redundancy is going to increase in April. And then of course, we've got the additional bank holiday um, on the 8th of May. Um, there's some changes on the horizon which relate to um, rights to request flexible working, introduction of carers leave, um, and in particular with regard to that um, one week unpaid um, leave for those caring, um, an introduction of neonatal care leave and pay. There are extended redundancy protections during pregnancy and maternity leave on the horizon too. Um, so at the moment, um, employees who are on maternity leave are protected in terms of they have to be offered 
um, alternative work, um, alternative roles in a redundancy situation, but that will be extended to um, those employees who are pregnant in the workplace and pregnant and also when they return from maternity leave. Um, introduction of liability to third party harassment um, and new rules to ensure that tips are being passed to workers in full. Um, just to note that menopause is um, not going to be made a protected characteristic despite efforts to make it a protected characteristic. So we will still be relying upon disability and sex in terms of um, protected characteristics in pursuing claims related to menopause. Um, and the strike bill is currently being considered by the House of Lords. Um, but it is very questionable whether that will get through. Um, and the backlog of cases in the Employment Tribunal continues to grow. Um, and there's a huge backlog. If any of you are involved in tribunal claims at the moment, they're being listed on average a year, a year and a half from the date the claim is made. Um, and I've got a figure of um, the backlog more than 50,000 cases awaiting a hearing or decision um, at the end of last year. I mean, that's huge. So, um, well, I've got cases listed for back end of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. There. We're finished. Yes, yeah, sorry, I've gone over. Apologies. No, no, that's all right. It's all, all really great stuff. So thank you, Keely, for another really informative session. Um, we all really appreciate it. Uh, I'll send the slides out um, and a copy of the, um, of the presentation to you in the next week or so. So but if you've got any questions and you want to speak to Keely, obviously you've got her contact details on this slide. Um, but if anybody's got any ideas or other topics that they want um, the HR huddle to cover, then you know feel free to reach out to me directly and um, I can get those organised for you. But thank you very much for joining us today and I look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.